Lot was a spontaneous manifestation of, 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 of something that came out of a conversation that we had. When Kerry came to visit me in England in April 2006, which feels like a couple of lifetimes ago, and we were in Tintagel in Cornwall, and that's the, one of the fabled supposed homes of King Arthur, and it's a very magical place, and as you probably no, many of the people watching this will know that southern England is full of Stonehenge and Avebury and and and, and ancient places with 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 um, legend behind them like Glastonbury. And Tintagel is one of those places, and we were there because you wanted to do a sort of little tour of of Stonehenge and all these other places. We did. Right, I hadn't been to England, and I was very excited to go there. I went there after I had. On the way back from Egypt, although it's not really <laughs> on the way back to America per se, but we had made a connection when I interviewed him for the Serpo project. And um, I had already picked up a, a consumer grade camcorder and was, uh, was, was going around it, trying to make a mini documentary um, because I'd become frustrated with the glass ceiling in Hollywood. And I was fascinated. I had been do doing a tremendous amount of research and I decided I just wanted to go to conferences and start interviewing people and, and sort of bring their stories to the, to the actually entertainment community um, because I thought they were so striking and yet they weren't in the major media. And um, I interviewed Bill for Serpo and I found him to be very balanced and intelligent and had a good sense of humor and was able to handle my questions very well. And we ended up going to dinner and just having a nice conversation and staying in touch over the email when he went back to England. So when I traveled to Egypt, I decided to stop by and say hello to him. And he he offered to tour, do, take me on a tour around Stonehenge and Tintagel and all this. And in Tintagel, we, I really connected to the Arthurian you know, legend and the energy there, and, and so did he. And it, we just turned to each other at one point and said, you know, we have these skill sets. What could we do together? Is there something that we could do together? And we both, I mean, it was really in a conversation, like we turned to each other, we said, what can we do together? And then we landed on, well, here I am a filmmaker and he's a writer and we're both very enthusiastic to have disclosure. And, and a whistleblower had contacted him in the meantime because he was on Serpo and he was the webmaster for Serpo. And just a, people writing you emails just saying, you know, whatever they say. And then this particular whistleblower ended up to be our first interview together, which was Mr. X. And, um, and, and, and you know, the rest is history, as they say. Um, so it, it, it blossomed really instantaneously. And we didn't ever second guess it. We never said, oh, should we do this? Is it a good idea? We just decided, I mean, we, we literally named it Project Camelot then and there in Tintagel. I mean, we're just driving away and we're saying, what, you know, well, what's a good name? <laughs> we wanted to call it Camelot. And yet, of course, you know, there's a zillion Camelots if you do a search on the net. And I'd written a screenplay called Project Moondust. And I'd, and I'd worked at JPL in the media area for a short time. And so I was aware that the, that the top secret projects were always called, started with the word project a lot of times. Project Monarch, Project This, Project That. And so um, I thought, well, what the hell, let's put project in front of it like they do. And there you have it, voila. And there was no such thing as a Project Camelot on the internet. And so we were, we were able to do it. That we were aware of. It's actually later when we Googled <laughs> our own name that I thought, wait a minute, that's not us. And then we saw this thing. Oh, right. That, there's an that, army. That, uh, there's a thing that happened in the, 70, in, in yeah, the 60s or something, but which we, we didn't also, even know about. But we also um, had the round table uh, in mind because mm -hmm. we wanted to use Camelot specifically um, because of the idea of, of, a, of a round table where everyone is on equal footing. And therefore, there are no secrets because you don't have hierarchies. So this is really the key. It was actually what Alex Collier yesterday was talking, was referring to as a holographic organization. But because Arthur didn't have um, uh, holograms, he called it the Knights of the Round Table. He didn't call it the Holographic Knights Organization. <laughs> but we are now, we are a holographic organization. And I didn't realize that until he coined the term. It's quite fun, isn't it? We're holographic. And we are in a sense because there's a serious point here because what what we want is for other people to do what we did. Um, we're not trying to 
invite people to copy us, but we're inviting people to say, listen, um, we've shown that what you can do in a moment of madness when you're having a good time, you can look at each other, a couple of people, for example, and say, what can we do together? And we know that people at this conference this weekend have been having those exact same conversations. you know. And some people come up to us and they say, what can we do? And my response, my standard response to them is saying, well, whatever makes you excited, whatever makes you think, you know what, if I dared to dream this, this is what I could create. Maybe, just maybe, you know, I can. I sound like Obama. I mean, I don't want to, you know, <laughs> I mean, that's dreadful. But behind those no, words, no. there's some truth, you know. <laughs> no, I mean, but, it's true. I mean, I follow your dream. I mean, I, mean, I think that dream. there is an element of that. I mean, when I picked up the camcorder and just said, screw it, you know, I'm sick of Hollywood, I'm sick of them, you know, sort of not letting me make the movies I want to make because we all, it's all about money, right? Mm -hmm. That's, you mm -hmm. get to be a producer because you have money and you're able to, you know, have influential friends or whatever. And I, I, I just, I just became, you know, very frustrated with that. And I said, I'm going to just do it, you know, like, I like that coin, mm. that term, uh, you know, and I have to, I don't want to plug mm. Nike here, but I'm really about that. I, th I think that you need to just go out and do it. And we decided to do the guerrilla filmmaking style because I was a fan of guerrilla filmmaking. And what it means is it's really more avant-garde. It's really more cutting edge. And it's actually taking pride in that notion. In other words, it doesn't have to be all polished. And one of the things about the Disclosure Project, Stephen Greer, I mean, I was hardly aware of that, but Bill was quite familiar with it. And, but I have to say that one thing we became aware of was that he, he was waiting to release his footage because he wanted it professionally edited. He wanted that professional look, so-called. And basically, that's just conforming to the matrix. That's conforming to the, paradigm, the old paradigm. And what I decided that I wanted us to do was I loved that sort of, you know, fresh look of guerrilla filmmaking of sometimes it's in you can see it in MTV videos. Certainly, you know, 10 mm. years ago, you could. It's very professionally synthesized what they do. They spend millions of dollars making something look rough. It's like, it's like somebody who has a punk haircut. You know, it's that professional, deliberate um, uh, uh, engineered way of looking unkempt and shoddy, you know. Yeah, it's a little bit like there's holes you've got in your jeans. You know? <laughs> ex <laughs> except that it was intentional. Those are expensive holes. It, there yeah. wasn't, an, I mean, if yeah. you study filmmaking, mm. there has been an intentional movement in that direction, you know, to break the mold, to get out of the old, and to move into a new way of looking at the world mm. and, and break the rules. And breaking yeah. the rules mm. became kind of um, the motto for Camelot. So that's that's kind of what we've done. And and you name it. I mean, what's happening with the ground crew and conferences sprouting up all over the world, you know, um, they, they created a, a, a conference after, you know, a week of preparation in Amsterdam, and they had over 200 people. I mean, it was ex astonishing. And we said, yes, we'll go. And, it, and that was that, you know, mm. and other people said yes. And, and, and there you have it. We had a conference. Mm. And who knew that conferences would cr be who created knew? like yeah. that? And, and then there but was this, another one in Poland. And now there's one in Brussels. And I mean, mm. they're just sprouting up all over the place. And it's like a movement. But the inspiration, which, again, I, I would like to convey to any, anyone watching this. Uh, this is someone who you haven't yet met. He's a wonderful person in Poland called Janusz Zagorski. And the event which I attended a couple of weeks ago, uh, the first time he did that in 2002, there were seven people. In 2000, and, he, and then he did it again. And then there were 20 people the next year. This year, there are 600. And then coming out of this, he's doing an event with us and David Icke, which is going to be huge. And it's just like, if you want to, an oak tree, you've got to plant the acorn. It has to start. You've got to do it. Don't just wait. You know, and and... What we're trying to encourage people to do is just pick up the ball and run with it. And whatever excites you, whatever enthuses you, just do it. We got it. This is a movement. And it's a grassroots movement. It's a guerrilla movement. It's not an organization. It's a holographic manifestation of a new way of interacting with the world that is the antithesis of the pyramidal structure. Very good. A lot of people like to know how we finance ourselves. We do travel the world occasionally, although not as often as we'd like, <laughs> um, because we don't have enough money to do it as often as we'd like. Um, but whenever possible, that was part of our sort of mandate to, to take the camera to the person, to set it up in front of them, and to film in person, like person to person. 
and that was really important. In other words, we didn't want to do a long distance uh, interview and we didn't want to do a written interview. We wanted it to be right there. We wanted that intimacy so that people would know if they were being told a lie or the truth. And you can really tell that much more so if you see, you know, if you see a close up and you get the emotional, you know, uh, flow from the person. So that that actually was was part of what 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 we were going to do. So what happened initially with Camelot was that my mother passed away and I had a, a small inheritance, quite small. <laughs> but as it turned out, it was enough to finance us for the first two years. And um, that's what I used to buy my consumer grade camcorder. And um, it was only because of that that I was freed from working like in, you know, the normal eight to five job, right? And so that's why I was traveling at the time. And, and, and basically, we, we used that. And then Bill had had a company that he dissolved right before I met him. And so he had a, a small amount of money from that. And basically, we just paid out of our own mm. pockets for two years. But and then context. we had the intelligence to actually put on our site a button saying, you know, if you mm. want to donate to our cause, because we're running out of money. And... Um, and then what happened, and this is bizarre, but his mother passed away, and you know, this is life. And then he had a small inheritance, and, and we were able to use a little of that money. But basically, we got to the place where we thought, well, we're gonna have nothing left very soon, so we had to start asking people to help support our cause, to help make it possible. And strangely enough, I mean, they just came out of the woodwork and, and have been, been there every, every month. But and there's some context. that's how I pay my rent. I mean, literally. There's some context here which is important for people to understand. We're not... Yeah. We're not married. We don't have families. <laughs> we don't have children. True. We don't have any real estate. We don't... We, we own very little. There was a period when everything that I owned that wasn't in, in storage in England after after I sold my house three or four years ago, I could carry in one bag, and that one bag basically contained a few T-shirts, a couple of pairs of trousers, and, uh, um, and a few pairs of socks, and one pair of shoes, you know, and one hat. And we don't own much. I don't even have a cell phone. I don't have a television. I don't have a mortgage plan. Uh, I don't have any life insurance. We don't have a pension plan. We don't have any savings. We don't live like normal people because we don't interact with the world in the normal way. So we don't have those financial commitments. Um, it's quite easy for us and to... And we don't believe in things like life insurance and health insurance mm -hmm. and all this nonsense. Um, we believe in natural healing and so on. So we are not, I mean, smart or dumb. We, that's, mm -hmm. we just don't have any mm -hmm. of that, that baggage. And it, we didn't, it's true, we didn't have children. And we were both single. There was a weird sort of synchronicity going on that we were both sort of free spirits in, in, in a sense. So we were like, it was also the danger element. We could turn to each other and say, sure, there could be danger involved in what we want to do. But in the end, it's only the two of us to turn to and decide, you know, do you want to do this or not, you know? And, um, and as it happens, of course, with our families having passed on in that way, I mean, I have sisters and, and, and brother, but uh, I don't, my parents have about, both died. So, um, you know, so there's no one to be responsible to other than myself. I could go on for quite a long time about what we don't have. It's quite interesting, you know. The little consumer-grade camcorder that you started with, it's actually smaller than the lens on that camera there. It's really quite funny, you know. My car has done 400,000 oh, kilometers. It's please. worth about, I mean, Kerry... The thing is a disaster. I yeah, mean, but you know, the point I mean, is that I'm not driving around in a limo. <laughs> the point is that I'm not spending money on my car because it's worth $300 and it's not the kind of car that you spend money on. But it works. And my attitude towards life is that as you can see from the way that I dress and from the way that I interact, I don't have a gold watch. I don't have any watch. I don't own a watch. Um, I don't need a watch because I ask someone else what the time is. This, um, I have a computer which works quite well, and that's important because... Yeah, our computers my, matter. Because for several years now, my priorities have been communication, travel, and, I mean, not travel like... I mean, earlier on you were saying touring the world, I think, but it was not like going around on a cruise liner. We were talking right. about using budget airlines to travel from place to place because it's got to do with, with, with having to travel to get information to communicate with people. And, and staying in, and the, in the cheapest hotels. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's actually, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not shy about the fact that I love 
expensive hotels. She loves expensive hotels. And I would prefer hotels. to travel yeah. much more in style. So if anyone out there is listening, you know, yeah. you're welcome to uh, send us more money for that purpose. But, but, the, but the bottom line is that we really live cheaply and we're able to do so because we are, you know, we're revolutionaries at heart. I mean, I think that's the bottom line. So everything we do is unconventional, pretty much. You know, um, but that doesn't mean we don't like beautiful things or, or appreciate them. It's just that we have a mission and we're very dedicated to the mission that we set out to do. We want to, to have truth. We want to change the world. And we, we decided we were damn well going to do it. Now, we hope it's happening. And we actually see it happening now around us. And, and it's, it's with things like this conference where the other people are picking up the ball and coming to us and saying, well, I'm doing this and I want to do that. And can I contribute? And can I do this? And I mean, it's, it's like, it is like a rolling snowball. It's amazing. It's growing and growing. And, um, and it's, it's a magical process. And I don't even know. I mean, we had no idea. We didn't know if three people would come to our website when we decided <laughs> we were building it. And, 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 and he's not even an expert webmaster. I mean, As it's, is it's evident like, to anyone who is. Yeah. We don't have a content management mm. system. We didn't even know we would get this big, you know. We just looked at each other, said mm. we're going out to do interviews, and we didn't know what we were going to encounter. But our attitude towards, towards self-funding is related to what we were saying just a, just a short while ago about the spirit in which we envisage Camelot in the first place. What most people do, it's a standard commercial model, and of course there are very good reasons for that, and that is that we have some information, we'll give it to you, but you send us a check first and then we'll send you a DVD, because we've got something that you want, you've got something that we want, and so we'll trade. And that's what buying and selling is. Our philosophy was very, very different. It was in the Arthurian tradition. It's like no one owns this information. We can't sell something that we don't own. It's not our information to sell. And so we reversed the process, which is, look, we're going to make this available first and then assume that the energy comes back. It's, it's exactly the same principle, but we're going to give it away first and then assume that the energy comes back. But it was and also it, based on, the, for me, it was based also on the model of the Internet anyway. Um, I mean, it was, it was interesting because without the Internet, we wouldn't be where we are today. We wouldn't have the movement growing. So we had to have that first. And the internet, the, the whole philosophy of the internet is people didn't want to pay for things. So it was interesting that we also, I mean, we, we were totally in alignment with that model anyway. We wanted to make things available for people free. And so we said, how can we do this? Let's just do it. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, there was no question in our mind. We never even argued about it. You know, oh, let's charge them $10 a video or something. We didn't do that. We, we just aspect decided of the to radical do that. trust. It's like it's it's a relationship of radical trust with everything that we're doing. That everything's going to work out. It's like you jump off the cliff and the angels will catch you. But you've got to jump first before you find out whether the angels really will catch you. But guess what? They always do. You know, um, and and most people want a guaranteed signed contract from the angels first before they think about jumping. And that's what keeps <laughs> yeah. people in their box. That's true. You see, that's, that's what keeps people in their true. box. And I think. My personal view is that, some, is, is that an aspect of the shift, people call, talk about the shift, define the shift, what is the shift, the new way of thinking, the new way of interacting with life, the universe and everything that we've got, which is all around us at the moment, has got something to do with giving up one's fear and, and embracing the unknown with the kind of energy that makes things work out. And that includes, on a macro scale, everything on this planet that might just work out if we dare, be, dare to believe that it would, but you've still got to jump. And so on the micro scale, what we're doing is we're epitomizing this by saying, look, we're trusting that things are going to work out, but at the same time, you've got to take action. So here we go. Who's coming with us? And by the way, we've got a camera with us so that we can have some fun along the way by documenting what we do. The whole thing is a microcosm of the transition that we really want this planet Earth to be. Very good. That was very good, wasn't it? Yeah. I invented that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I want to write that down. <laughs> um, you have done now, three, three years later. I mean, it's been going for like three years, hasn't it? Yeah. Uh, actually, more than three years. Okay. But anyway, Since April, yeah. so it's, uh, what is this, September? Three years and a bit. Yeah. Three and a half years. Today, uh, as we speak, you have an impressive list of interviews and audio, uh, both video and audio interviews. And uh, this amazes people. Uh, and my question is how... It amazes us. 
how do you go about <laughs> to get all this pretty sensitive information out? I mean, uh, how the people that you approach, are they willing to share this openly, or, or do you have to go through a lot of negotiations and, uh, and stuff to, to get them where you want them? Oh, well, yes. I mean, they don't share it easily. Um, and and it, it's a huge... Yeah. Uh, Start again, repeat the question. Okay. Um, okay. One thing, I guess, it, there's, a, there's a psychology to whistleblowers, and we try to talk, to talk about that when we do conferences a lot. And it is important to realize that the information we're getting doesn't come easily, and that the people giving it are giving it, they're coming forward as whistleblowers, but they're, whistle, they're whistleblowers from the matrix. And so they're, they're putting themselves at personal risk. They're putting their families at risk. Um, and so there's a way and a maneuvering that has to happen in order for us to actually get the information out. And a lot of times, the real whistleblowers, we haven't been able to get on camera um, until later, or not at all. Um, for example, Jake Simpson has never gone on camera. Um, and Henry Deacon, for the longest time, wouldn't go on camera. He only recently came forward um, on stage at Barcelona with me and in Zurich uh, briefly with, with Brian O'Leary. Um, and that was really a movement from the heart to support, at least in Barcelona, Bob Dean and what he was saying about Mars. And uh, again, in, in Zurich, uh, to, to support the free energy um, movement in essence that the Brian O'Leary was talking about so but in as there's a huge process that we go through um, both in getting to know the whistleblower spending time with them uh, we do check uh, credentials if there are any but what people maybe what people maybe don't realize is that a lot of times there aren't credentials there is no documentation um, and now Jake Simpson says to us, don't ever get hard evidence. It's, it's what protects us. Because what we concentrate on is witness testimony. And everyone can say that that's got plausible deniability and that, you know, they can say, well, this person's lying or they're, they're crazy or whatever. And that, that goes on a lot. In fact, I think that they allow Henry Deacon to say all the things he has about having been to Mars um, Arthur Newman, who he's, or Neumann, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Um, basically, you know, because they think, oh, well, this guy's off his head. He's crazy. Nobody's going to believe him. And, and so maybe in time, they, you know, they won't believe him. But someday when history is written, he will be the first person who ever came forward in, in the history of the world, you know, as we know it anyway. Um, to say that I, you know, to come on stage and to say he'd been to Mars. I mean, this is, this is absolutely earth-shattering. It should be on the front page of every newspaper in the world. It isn't because they, they don't want you to know it. And so um, it's, it's a fascinating process. I mean, we, we spent hours and nights, and, and we, we talk until 3 or 4 in the morning with these people. Um, we just get to know them quite well. And we also... Um, we have a process also in the very beginning because a real whistleblower, when they write to you, does not say, um, you know, I'm a whistleblower. They actually usually don't even see themselves in that role. They send us a message. They feel compelled to talk. They want to, they want to convey the secrets that they know. There's a movement, um, sort of an, a, a, a subtle movement under, under the current of, of what we're going through right now in the world that says, Let's get to the root of what's really, what it really means to be human. What's really going on here. Let's stop playing all these games. And, and underneath all that, you've got whistleblowers that are working on the inside. And there's still many of them in there. And they want to come forward. There's something, when you know secrets, there's something so compelling to want to tell your secret. Especially when it affects humanity. When it could be the safety of the world, you know, the, of, of the people of the world. Let me add my perspective to this because it also dovetails with what we've been talking about, our style, our approach, our philosophy, the guerrilla filmmaking. You see, we're not presenting ourselves as a tribunal or a court of law assembling evidence to try and prove a case. There are other people who are approaching these problems like this and it's wonderful that they're doing that. 
we're all working as part of a team and we're taking different roles in this kind of very large job. But what we're doing is something slightly different. We're actually trying to change the way that people think about this stuff and the way that people think about the people. One of the things that I think that we may be doing, not because of any grand strategic plan, but it seems to be working out like that, is we're changing the way that people look at the, at the human dilemmas faced by some of these people who are on the inside. They're not all nasty, evil, robotic people who've been programmed by the government who are doing as they're told and they're just, you know, killing on command or, 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 or doing all these unethical things and then suddenly feel compelled to talk about it. Their process is a very complex one that can involve all kinds of internal complex because they have been often lied to just like we have and their process of becoming awake and aware is a gradual one sometimes, very much like it is on the outside. On the inside this whole process is mirrored and one of the things that we think that we have started to do is to convey to the to people who want to understand this dynamic better, the fact that it's very, very complex, and just as Kerry has said, it actually revolves around the humanity of the people involved. It's not about analysing uh, uh, little bits of metal that, 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 that seem somehow strange in a metallurgical laboratory and showing a spectrographic analysis to the people on the camera. That's not what we do. What we do is we show the people. And when people look at who we're talking to, through the eyes of the camera, which is the best substitute we have for our audience being with us in person. Then they look at this person's eyes, we ask them the questions and they say, look, there's something going on here. This person isn't lying, or this person is conflicted, or in the case of someone like Bob Dean and some other people we've interviewed, they've become so deeply emotionally expect affected by their experience that you say, this is something that is now affecting me as someone watching all of this and we're all in this together as humanity which is in which is experiencing a transition and it's an emotional journey just as much as it is a factual one and that's the way that we regard this issue of proof uh, are there uh, any cases where you have felt that you had to protect the uh, the objects or that have been into you against themselves I mean is everything are you, are your interviews put out as is I mean do you take things out do you do any type of editorial uh, treatment to it afterwards no you know it's really interesting um, What's the, question? the reason we have uh, the reason we have two hour uh, long or three hours sometimes even four hour interviews and this is you know again these are not sound bites we spend the time on the camera filming for hours with these people and we don't we really rarely edit anything out um, it, unless there's something like um, literally like they stumble and they say maybe the name of the place they're from or something like that in the context of, of that and, and, and in that case we'll remove it um, but by and large what you see on that camera is what we got and although you'll see cutting because we're cutting between cameras and that's more of a style issue. What I'm trying to do um, often is, is we have a roving camera, as, as most people will know, and then we have a stationary one. The stationary one is always on the witness. Um, the roving one will get the interviewer, which will be me or Bill, and then also cutting over you know, with a quick pan over to the interviewee. And sometimes the you know, it's, it's more to sort of the flow of a two-hour interview. It's, it's difficult to just have a stationary camera. So what I tried to do was make give it sort of a, a feeling of motion, a feeling of let me look at this person from another angle because sometimes that helps in evaluating the material or evaluating whether the person is telling the truth. If you, if you always look at them head-on, straightway, it, it, it doesn't always give you a moment to sort of step back and look at a different angle. So... Um, so what, what I would say is, by and large, what you see is what you get. It's all there. And we never, we never edit out those people. We never say, um, oh, these, this, this can't be true, so we're not going to put it in. <laughs> well, it's very funny there. It's and the we first... do get stuff that we don't agree with, you know. 
What's funny there is the first interview that you did with me, which you referred to earlier as the webmaster of the SOPO project, when I, I was just a messenger there, basically, who got caught up in a massive web of intrigue, and that's a whole different topic, um, because some of that stuff was true, I tell you. Um, you were really worried because the interview was 16 minutes long, and you thought... You know, <laughs> And he thought this is way too long for anyone's attention, and he wanted to cut it down to 12 minutes. And you were, and I said, for goodness sake, don't cut anything out. 16 minutes is okay. People, I mean, now it's it's, it's like kind of three hours and 16 minutes, not not 16 minutes. And a lot of people, I mean, we 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 heard from somebody yesterday who said that they've been waiting for the Pete Peterson interview to be released. They got themselves ready, they took a day off, they took their phone off the hook, they downloaded everything, they put it on their widescreen TV, they sat back, they got all the TV meals ready and they just sat down. I mean, <laughs> they just watched the whole thing. It's like Lord of the Rings, you know. And, and it's like, my God, we're providing, you know, major... <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely, for people. yeah. That's, it's beautiful. We don't know what people do with us. And stuff. it's so much more you know, in depth than you know than the normal fare that they get. So, mm -hmm. so I think yes, it is a story. Each person has their story, and that's also what unfolds in these in these interviews. And the fact that we give them the two hours to really go the breadth of, of whatever it is they want to say, um, it it means a lot. And the trust and the dy dynamic that's set up between us and the interviewee. Um, it, 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 it is translated. It shows on the camera, I think. Um, your approach uh, in the interviews, uh, I have, well, had, I reckon that when you started, you, were, you had a very journalistic approach. I mean, you were kind of, kind of like a neutral part, just wanting to get the information through. And I have observed through some of the later interviews that you have actually become parts of the discussion. Uh, is that uh, something that is, uh, is, is this a, uh, a strategy or is it just because you have became, become so personally involved in the subject? Um, well, I think, I, I'm not sure if you realize, but we have two styles. One style is to, to, in, to do an interview in which we're getting information from the subject, okay? Um, and those are, are pretty obvious. You have a roving camera, as I said, and a set, pers a set camera in which it's always on the interviewee. An example Another of that was Joseph Farrell, for example, who is a good presenter. Um, and basically we said, OK, um, tell us about all of this stuff. And then we prompted him with a few questions. And then he did a presentation almost like he would have done on stage. Right. Well, OK, but... If I'm interviewing, I rarely allow that to happen, but okay. Um, but <laughs> um, no, but there's another, another thing that we have going on. We have planes going overhead here, so I'm trying to, uh, to, to wait for the, a clear audio moment here. Um, it's, it's okay. Okay. Uh, we have something called a future talk, and we have begun to use that format more and more. And what that is, is a conversation. It is not an interview. And sometimes people mistake that. Um, for example, with David Icke, we really didn't do an interview. And the reason for that was that we feel that David Icke is already exposed more than enough on the Internet. People know his material. What would be the point of just having him reiterate the same thing over and over again? Um, but a conversation in which we can have, because we've become, we have gotten down the rabbit hole quite deep, deeply at this point. We are extremely knowledgeable, I mean, I have to say, with the subject matter, so that we're not independent um, observers anymore so much as we are um, sort of compatriots with, with our interviewees. And so we, we also want to get different angles. So a conversation is necessary, really. And um, this is, again, a break in style because there's also the side of it, which has always un been underlying the work, if you listen to closely the interviews, such that my questions are not just idle questions. They're not just like sit back and sort of let the person go. It, they are, you know, um, I am trying to get at things. And what those things are, are not, is not always clear to me even. But what I know is I know when I hear it that we're getting to a deeper level of the secret, okay? And that's really the motivation for changing 
sort of the pace and for um, for the way we the, the style that we use even in interviews. But there are two two really clear set styles. One being the future talk, which is a conversation, and in that case, Bill and I will interject. We had. Um, one of our, our, our talks, uh, which is called Jump Room to Mars with, with David Wilcock and, and, and us. And it, that was one of the first times we investigated doing this new style. And we were talking about Henry Deacon and then David Wilcock's uh, witness, Daniel. And really, that is just, it's like a roundtable discussion. Well, yeah. It was literally after we'd had dinner and we sat around the dinner table and it wasn't so much us interviewing Wilcock, but it was recording in real time David's reactions when we were telling him stuff that he hadn't heard. And then correlate, having him have the correlator, having, let me start that one again, having, giving him the opportunity to correlate that with the information that he got from his own sources, which we hadn't heard. And so the whole thing was a fascinating conversation. And the opportunity, which is once again, what we're trying to do with our audience is we bring the camera along so that people can share this journey with us. They're here as we're doing this, as we're discovering things, as we're learning things. We don't rehearse things. We don't set up our interviewees or the people we're talking to by saying, okay, this is what we're going to be talking, talking about first. Um, it's all live. As it yeah, it's that's, all another, live. that's important. I think that maybe this hasn't come out in a lot of interviews is mm. that we don't prepare ahead of time. In, in, in any formal fashion. I never write down questions. I never even know what I'm going to ask until I get there. It's, it's completely off the cuff. That's the way we do it. Mm. We just go from mm. the cuff. And, we, and you know, we, we actually do that a lot on our presentations on stage. Um, no one would ever know. <laughs> well, stop. <laughs> I mean, no, I, I have to say that the, reason that the reason that matters is that it allows us to go with the flow of where things are being revealed and, 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 and be stimulated naturally by just what's going on in the conversation. And so almost every interview in the end becomes a kind of a conversation because of that. You know? And what it does is take down the division between us and the interviewee, the interviewer you know, and interviewee. It, it actually breaks down that wall that says you're over there and I'm over here. It actually makes us part of this it sort of creates this round mm. in which, my God, if you, you know, if you want to talk at length to us at the moment, we would go for it. And when we're just not in some kind of box with this stuff, you know, we really want to see what's going to happen. We want to go mm. with that. But there's an aspect to this very interesting question because, because, of course, there was a coded aspect of the question that wasn't explicitly stated and this is that um, how come the Stephen Greer interview ended up as it did because usually um, <laughs> you know and, and case in point and the way that it did end up um, it ended up a little bit like the audio visual version of a WWF wrestling match you know without a referee <laughs> um, and uh, and s some people let us know that they were really uh, shocked and surprised by that because it's like, wait a minute, you know, you're meant to be the interviewer asking questions of this person and as Kerry's just explained, that isn't the way that it works. But there is an energetic dimension in there because usually what happens with our interviewees you see let me back up a little bit here for three years, we have never criticized anybody. We've never taken anyone to task. We don't go around like UFO skeptics trying to debunk stories. We know that there are hoaxes out there. We know that there are people whose stories don't stand up. We know that there are some people who've been got at. We leave them alone and we go our own way by focusing on the positive. And people who have followed our work from our beginning know that we do this. Every now and then, people say, well, well, why don't you interview such and such? And even now, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make any name. I'm not going to mention any names. And we just don't go there because we don't want to be promoting or exploring or putting people's attention on a story that we think doesn't, doesn't hold up. Well, um, I've got 10 minutes left of tape, and this has been going on very long. So, but I, <laughs> I told you. <laughs> I wonder, if, if, is it possible now in the last uh, 10 minutes to have you to sum up your main impressions of the information you have got. I mean, uh, this is, will also be seen by people who are not so into these topics. I mean, what have you disclosed from your conversations? What is 
I mean, is, if, it, if it's a laundry possible, list, yeah, a laundry yeah. list of, of fascinating uh, disclosures. But if you could give us like the five hardest points of uh, of what you have disclosed. What's our summary of what's going on in the yeah. whole in yeah. in the universe? You've got I, ten I, minutes, Gary. Okay. Yeah. Well, I know it's an impossible <laughs> question, but. It no, is. I mean, if we were going to, I think it's very, that's a very good question. I think that, that, that there is a, a summation that could happen in which we talk about literally what has been disclosed, how we have broken through the matrix and found out some of the real truths that are operating. One, I'll tell you right off the bat, is the disclosure of the secret space program. That's, that's really sometime, in some ways the cornerstone for the entire structure of secrecy that's been built up around everything to do with ETs, to do with off-planet capability, to be free energy, you name it. It all comes back to the secret space program. Um, so I would say that what we've begun to do is to paint that program and to paint people that have come out of that program and have worked in that program in various capacities. And among other things, um, superluminal travel, uh, that we have bases on Mars and the Moon. Um, you know, the, that there is um, huge underground bases, not only in the United States, but all over, over the world, and that they're there for a purpose, and that there's something coming in the future, sometime from t 2012 on, in which it could be a planet, it could be, a, you know, a planetoid, it could be a super wave. Um, there are lots of possibilities, and we're still delving down that rabbit hole. But we're certainly starting to reveal what humanity may be facing in the future. And some of it, some of this yeah. knowledge could save people's, li people's lives. And that's the bottom line. Let me back up on this. You see, there's something that we're not being told. And then the two things that come from that, it's like, if there's something you're not being told, then why not? Is it because we can't handle the truth? Well, we see, it's like, if there's a little you know, spaceship up there with some friendly people in it, then that sounds like the kind of thing that would be good news for all of humanity. We're not being told that. So what is it about this that is the truth that they think we can't handle? Maybe it's complicated. Maybe it's not good news. Maybe it's challenging. Maybe it implies uh, something that, the, uh, that could be uh, a one-way transition for the human race that might be a difficult thing and so where these questions lead it's like why is there a secret space program why is there a space program why is it secret where have all the trillion dollars have gone why is why have has there been an enormous international construction project the largest construction project in human history that we know of has taken place in the second world war with the establishment of thousands of underground bases in every first world country in the northern hemisphere and in australia and probably south america and probably southern africa why what are they wanting to dig in and protect themselves against is this something that they know is going to happen is it something that they fear might happen and it's just standard military thinking is the secret space program a lifeboat program so that if the, if, the, if the ship sinks then they can jump into the little ships and go somewhere else? These are really important questions. Um, I don't doubt that the human race is going to survive whatever's going to happen. I'm not even sure if anything's going to happen at all. But we're playing a chess game. We're trying... It's a little bit like we're in a movie. And you've got all these weird things that are happening, and we're two-thirds or three-quarters of the way through the movie, and we're trying to say, well, this thing happened, what does that mean? This thing happened, and what does that mean? And what are these characters doing? Who's a good guy? Who's a bad guy? And how does this all tie together? And is there a twist in the end? And we're sort of trying to figure out the plot of this movie, like anyone watching a Hollywood movie, and we're kind of in the last half hour, and there's still some popcorn left. It's quite fun. It's exciting. It feels dramatic. We're in the movie. And everything that we're doing is trying to find the answer to all of these questions which I've just been tabulating. On top of which, I have to say, that we're also going down various rabbit holes. One of which is, where, what are, what's happening to all the children that are disappearing? You know, are abductions a real phenomena, which we found to be true? And yet, are they positive? You know, and who's doing it? Is it is it military and which ET groups are doing it? Are the ETs positive? What is their agenda? And if their agenda isn't positive, what does that mean for the human race? Because this is couldn't be more important. And it's this like the most important question in the fo in the history of humanity. And this and the fact is that there is an agenda, 
And the fact is that there are things rolling out and that there is an intention behind a lot of the things that are going on, whether they be wars, famines, uh, you know, uh, the, the virus that's being released uh, purposely on the human race at the moment. Um, there is an agenda and we are, we are actually finding out what those agenda items are, number one, and then why they exist and when they, are, they, they plan to roll yeah. out these various things and maybe how to combat them at the same time. I'd like to summarize this because I think we've only got a couple of minutes left. I know, but I just want to say uh, one more thing. I want to say that there's also the reptilian agenda, and that is very real. And we are starting to go down that rabbit hole, and we've gotten some testimony. started with Leo Zagami. It has to do with what the reptilians and possibly other races, part, maybe even part of the Anunnaki, who had an agenda from a long time ago and, and had something to do with creating the human race that's still rolling out today and has to do with why we are under the thumb of the Illuminati and various ruling groups today and, how, and what they are planning for us and why and why and, 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 and it has to do with human consciousness. This is exactly the point that I wanted to make. Maybe I can just close by saying that there's a problem here because the Illuminati regard themselves as playing God. They consider themselves to be the guardians and the saviors of the human race. They consider themselves to hold the responsibility on their shoulders of ensuring that this planet uh, survives and that the human race survives with it in whatever form it's possible to do that. But the issue is that we don't have a vote. We're not just cargo on the ship. We're crew on this ship and we do have some part to play in this and we do not give our consent to the fact that these lords and masters consider that they have power over the quality of our own lives and whether even our own lives continue at all it's got something to do with all of us and so we're taking this power back and it's got to do with the relationship between the hologram and the pyramid those guys even if they believe that they are doing the right thing which we're given to understand they are it's the structure of the relationship between all the characters involved which is the issue here. And this is what I thank Alex Collier for. It's got to do with all of us and we've all got to play a part in this together. And this is one of the main messages that Camelot brings. Thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. See, you just wanted 10 minutes. You've got to be careful what you wish for. <laughs>